Wow, well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Jim. And uh, we were at the Bureau actually at the same time back uh, in 19, must have been 1979. Um, so good afternoon. I am privileged and delighted to deliver the 2012 Martin Feldstein Lecture, honoring Marty's outstanding tenure as president of the NBER. And uh, as Jim said, it is particularly special because Marty gave me my start in economics research. He hired me, uh, I think after my sophomore year, uh, to work uh, at the Bureau and uh, then was my undergraduate thesis advisor. So Marty, uh, thank you for hiring me uh, and uh, for inspiring me to become an economist and professor uh, and for helping me along the way. Thanks. So today I'm going to explore some commonly held perceptions of executive compensation and corporate governance in the United States. So let's see, there we go. Uh, there are three general themes to these perceptions. The first, CEOs are overpaid and their pay keeps increasing. Second, CEOs are not paid for performance. Uh, and third, boards are not doing their jobs. Uh, in their influential work, uh, Lucian Bebchuk uh, and uh, Freed, uh, conclude, Lucian, you're here, there, uh, conclude that flawed compensation arrangements have not been limited uh, to a small number of bad apples. Uh, they have been widespread, persistent, and systemic. So in my talk today, I'm going to consider the accuracy of those perceptions today. What are the facts about CEO pay levels? Is it true that the typical CEO is not paid for performance? And how much and how well do public company boards monitor their CEOs, particularly for poor performance? And I guess more generally, you know, is our corporate governance system broken? So the recurring question that I'm, I'm going to try to address is what are the drivers of CEO pay and governance? Is it driven by the power that CEOs wield over their boards, leading CEOs to be overpaid? Uh, is pay driven by a competitive market for talent and CEOs are paid appropriately? Or is pay driven by some combination of those two forces and others? And once I've addressed those questions, I'll discuss the implications and challenges they pose for researchers, boards, and shareholders. So let's begin with the first perce perception. CEOs are overpaid and their pay keeps increasing. To answer this, you first have to define what CEO pay is, and there are two ways to measure CEO pay. The first is estimated or grant day pay, and this includes the CEO's salary, bonus, the value of restricted stock issued, and the estimated value of the options issued to the CEO that year, usually calculated with Black-Scholes uh, or some option valuation formula. This is the compensation package that the board has awarded the CEO, and it's the appropriate measure for assessing the effectiveness of board governance. It's what the board thought they were giving the CEO. The second measure is realized CEO pay, and that includes salary, bonus, the value of restricted stock, and the value of the options the CEO exercised. Because it uses actual option gains, not the theoretical values, the second measure is a better measure of the amount of money the CEO actually takes home in a given year. And accordingly, realized pay is the more appropriate measure for considering whether CEOs are paid for firm performance because the firm's actual performance affects the value of the options. So now let's see what happens when we look at estimated pay. And again, that's the pay awarded by the board to the CEO. And let's look at how that's moved over time. What I'm gonna begin with is the CEO of S&P 500 companies from 1993 to 2010 using data from Standard & Poor's ExecuComp database. And these are the largest publicly traded US companies. So now the question is, what has happened to average estimated CEO pay adjusted for inflation since 2000? Has it gone up? Has it stayed the same? Or has it declined? 
And you know, I'd ask you now, but I, I'm not sure what you will answer. So let me tell you what happened when I've asked other people this question. I asked this question to a group of corporate governance academics a little while ago. Uh, and I asked the question to a number of public company chief financial officers. In both audiences, somewhere between, I'd say, 50% and two-thirds said pay had gone up. About a quarter or a third said pay had been flat. And a few people said pay had gone down. And I think the perception is pay keeps going up and up and up. What happened? Well, while average CEO pay increased, and the blue lines are average and the red are median, while average CEO pay increased markedly from 93 to 2000, it declined by over 46% from 2000 to 2010. And median CEO pay also increased markedly from 93 to 2000, peaked in 2001, and has declined slightly since then. And that convergence between the means and the medians suggests that boards have become substantially less likely to award large and unusual pay packages to CEOs since 2000. So the first perception that pay keeps increasing, which is a perception that is widely shared, even by public company chief financial officers, turns out to be a misperception. Now, that doesn't mean there are still uh, not some outliers, and uh, the outliers do receive attention. And there were three CEOs uh, in 2010 who received over $50 million in estimated pay, and uh, those are hard to understand, but the means and medians indicate that they're outliers and not the general rule. So the ExecuComp database also includes the CEOs of more than 1,000 smaller companies not in the S&P 500. And average estimated pay for these CEOs, like those in the S&P 500, increased in the 90s and declined in the 2000s. The increases were smaller in magnitude than those for the S&P 500, uh, both the magnitude of the increases and the declines. But like the S&P 500 CEOs, the average pay levels today of the smaller company CEOs are roughly where they were in 1997 and 1998. So overall, estimated CEO pay, which is the pay that boards are expecting to pay, peaked in 2000 and 2001 for both groups and has returned to roughly the level it was in 1997 and 1998. Now, while average pay has declined, it remains quite high. So in 2010, the average S&P 500 CEO received estimated pay of just over $10 million, and the median was just over $8.5 million. And of course, these amounts are much greater than the income of the typical US household. Uh, average CEO pay peaked in 2000 at over 350 times the median. And while it's declined to roughly 200 times, that multiple is still very high and undoubtedly contributes to the perception that CEOs are overpaid. Now, there's one other element uh, to the comparisons of CEO pay over time that are worth mentioning. The average lengths of CEO tenures today are shorter than they were in the past. And so, as a result, comparing CEO pay in the 2000s to CEO pay in the 1990s and earlier is not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. In the 70s, 80s, and mid-90s, roughly 10% of CEOs of large U.S. companies turned over each year, not counting takeovers. And that implies a typical CEO tenure of roughly 10 years. Since 1998, that turnover has increased to about 12% a year, uh, which implies a decline in CEO tenure from 10 years to eight years. When takeovers are included, the tenures have declined from roughly eight years before 1998 to about six years now. So what does that mean? The decline in tenure implies that the CEO job has become riskier, and the shorter expected tenure arguably offsets 20% or so 
of the benefits of the increase in CEO pay over this period. So in other words, the true increase in CEO pay since the early 90s is lower than the compensation figures alone would suggest. So now let's look at how public company CEO pay compares to other highly paid groups. Although estimated CEO pay and CEO pay or CEO tenures have declined, it's clear that CEOs are highly paid and have done very well since the early 90s. The important question is why they have done so well. Uh, Gebex and Landier argue that market forces can explain the increases in CEO pay. In a simple competitive model, they show that CEO pay will be bid up as firms become larger because larger average firm size increases the returns to hiring a more productive CEO. And they find empirically that the increase in CEO pay since 1980 can be fully attributed to the increase in large company market values. So Gebex and Landier, as well as Friedman and Sachs, and Murphy and Zabonjic, focus on the market for top executives of public companies. But the same people also can become executives at private companies, become or remain consultants, and earlier in their career become lawyers, investment bankers, or investors. In a competitive market for talent, similarly talented individuals should have done as well as CEOs over the last 20 or 30 years. And this very familiar uh, graph uh, from Piketty and Saez shows that there is a big increase in the share of pre-tax income earned by very high earners over the last 30 years is consistent with a number of groups doing very well. And this is the top 0.1% uh, of adjusted gross income. So what I'm gonna do is compare the average estimated pay of S&P 500 CEOs to the average adjusted gross income of taxpayers in the top 0.1%. And in 2010, the average adjusted gross income of that group was just under $5 million. So it's a group that's comparable to the CEOs. Because there are roughly 140,000 such taxpayers, the 500 S&P 500 CEOs are not going to affect the average for that group. So let's see what happened. Uh, average estimated pay for S&P 500 CEOs relative to the average adjusted gross income of the top 0.1%. In 2010 is about what it was in 1994. So overall, over this period, S&P 500 CEOs have seen very little change in their estimated pay relative to where it was in the early 90s. Smaller company CEOs, the non-S&P 500 CEOs, have actually done slightly less well over time. Uh, in every year, the average non-S&P 500 CEO uh, was not in the top 0.1%, and today they're worse off relative uh, to the top 0.1% than they were in the early 1990s. So over the last 20 years, public company CEO pay relative to the very top has remained relatively constant or even declined. And those patterns are consistent with a competitive market for talent they're less clearly consistent with managerial power over that period. And that's because the other top income groups not subject to managerial power forces have seen a similar growth in pay. So what about the longer term? Uh, right now, I've just looked at pay through 19, or since 1993. What's happened since the 1930s? And to do this, I staple together three data sets. I use ExecuComp from 1992 to 2010. I use data from Hall and Liebman uh, for large company CEOs from 1980 to 1992. And I use data uh, from Friedman and Sachs for very large public companies from 1936 to 1980. And I compare this long time series of estimated CEO pay, again, to the average AGI of the top 0.1%. And over the long term, estimated CEO pay relative to the pay of that top 0.1% has, 
has remained, you know, it's fluctuated, but has remained stable, averaging roughly 1.9 times. The average is actually particularly low in the 1980s. It goes to the historical average in the mid-90s, got unusually high in the late 1990s, and in 2010, it's returned more or less to its long-term average. Now, the unanswered question is what drives the fluctuations uh, over time, but there seems to be a tendency to stay around two. Now, the next slide shows the ratio of average estimated CEO pay to the average market value of the top 500 publicly traded companies. CEO pay was a much higher fraction of market value in the 30s, 40s, and 50s than it was after 1960. And this you know, replicates the findings in Friedman and Sachs. Since 1960, however, the ratio of CEO pay to market value has remained much more stable, averaging about 0.04% of market value. And the ratio in 2010 was a little bit below that at 0.036%. So since 1960, the data support this simple Gebex and Landier story of a competitive market for talent. And the unanswered question is why the pattern is so different before 1960. So taken together, the long run pattern suggests that a combination of the market for talent and firm scale have been meaningfully associated with large company CEO pay over a long period of time. So I've now compared uh, CEOs to the average income of people in the top income brackets. It's also possible to compare the pay of public CEO or public company CEOs to the pay of specific groups in those brackets that are likely to have similar opportunities or talents, particularly non-public company executives lawyers and investors. So in a recent paper, uh, Bakija, Cole, and Heim study IRS tax return data between 1979 and 2005. They try to compare public company and private company executives by distinguishing those who receive the majority of their income in salary and wages from those who receive the majority of their income from self-employment. The former are more likely to include public company executives, while the latter are most likely to include executives of closely held businesses. And what you find is that the pay of executives of closely held businesses increased by more than the pay of salaried executives from 1979 to 1993, and again from 1993 to 2005. Furthermore, closely held firm executives increased their representation in the top 0.1% from just under 9% to 22%, whereas salaried executives went down going from 38% to 20%. So what you see there is that the public company executives, those who should have been more subject to managerial power problems, saw their pay and relative standing increase less than the executives of closely held company businesses that are by definition controlled by large shareholders or the executives and are subject to limited agency problems. And that's notable because many of the salaried and closely held executives presumably come from the same general executive pool and presumably can move between public and private company employment. Uh, Bakija, Cole, and Heim also distinguish among taxpayers who are employed as business executives and financial executives, and in their data, the income share of the top 0.1% increased by a factor of more than three times, the business executives increased by roughly the same three times, taxpayers in finance did even better, they increased their share by five times. So now lawyers. Lawyers at top firms are another useful comparison group, and they're not often mentioned. But much of the work these law firms uh, and lawyers provide is for corporate clients. And because the law firms are partnerships and their fees are negotiated in an arm's length manner, partner pay at those law firms is arguably market-based and not subject to managerial power concerns. 
Lawyers at top law firms also are interesting because the general counsels of large public companies are often former law partners. So accordingly, there's, there's some overlap in the market for talent between top executives and top lawyers. So what's happened to top law partner pay? It's also gone up quite a bit uh, from roughly $700,000 a year to almost $1.6 million in 2010. And the ratio of S&P 500 CEOs estimated pay to average profit per partner has remained roughly the same. If anything, uh, that ratio has gone down, meaning top law partners have done slightly better relative to public company CEOs over this period. Now, another highly paid group, uh, very highly paid, is top hedge fund managers. And since 2001, uh, Absolute Return in Alpha magazine has published uh, an annual rich list of the 25 highest paid hedge fund managers. And they estimate the annual income of those managers from fees and from their capital invested in the funds. So this is going to overstate the income of the hedge fund managers attributable to their employment uh, because it also includes some investment income. But nevertheless, the results are pretty interesting. So the average income of the hedge fund managers in uh, millions of 2010 dollars grew from $134 million in 2002 to a peak of over a billion dollars in 2007. And those are obviously much higher than the $10 million averages for S&P 500 CEOs. And to put this in perspective, you can compare the combined, sorry, that's the, there we go. You can compare the combined or total incomes of the 25 highest paid hedge fund managers to the total estimated pay of the 500 S&P 500 CEOs. And since 2005, those 25 top hedge fund managers as a group have earned two to six times as much as all 500 S&P 500 CEOs. So in other words, hedge fund managers uh, have done quite a bit better uh, than CEOs. So now, what does all this mean? Uh, the point of these comparisons is to confirm that while public company CEOs earn a great deal, they are not unique. And those other groups with similar backgrounds and talents, private company executives, corporate lawyers, investors, and others, have seen significant pay increases where there's a competitive market for talent and no managerial power problems exist. So, yeah, some people look at the, the higher CEO pay as evidence of managerial power or capture. You have to explain why these other professional groups uh, that don't have those issues have had a similar or even higher growth in pay. Uh, instead, it seems more likely that a meaningful portion of the increase in public company CEO pay has been driven by market forces. Now, what are those market forces? Uh, in our work, Josh Rao and I concluded that some combination of changes in technology, along with an increase in the scale of enterprises and finance, have allowed more talented or fortunate people to increase their productivity relative to others. And that seems relevant for the increase in pay of lawyers and investors. Technology allows them to acquire information and trade large amounts more efficiently. Uh, as well as CEOs, where technology allows them to manage very large global organizations. And under this view, as firms have become more valuable and technology has allowed CEOs to affect that value, boards have responded by spending more to attract and motivate talent. So that's pay levels. Now let's move to the second perception uh, that CEO pay is not tied to firm performance. And according to the managerial power story, managers control their boards, and boards are too friendly to management, and boards do not pay for performance or fire CEOs for poor performance. Now, the key question on pay is whether CEOs who perform better earn more in realized pay. And again, realized pay includes option exercises and is a better measure of what the CEO actually takes home. So for each year from 1999 to 2004, 
uh, in our paper, Josh Rao and I took all the firms in the ExecuComp database, sorted them into five groups based on assets. We did that because it's well established that larger firms pay more. And within each size group for each year, we sorted the CEOs into five groups based on how much compensation they actually realized. And then we looked at how the stocks of each group performed relative to their industry over the previous three years. And what we find in all the different size group is that realized compensation is very highly related to firm stock performance. So in every group, firms with CEOs in the top quintile of pay are the top performing quintile relative to their industries. And firms with CEOs in the bottom quintile of pay are the worst performing quintiles relative to their industry. And the magnitudes are relatively large. So the bottom line from this is that there is pay for performance when you look at realized pay. Similarly, Friedman and Sachs study the correlation between executive wealth and firm performance, and they find that CEO wealth has been strongly tied to firm performance since the 1930s, and that relationship strengthened considerably after the mid-1980s. Uh, Kevin Murphy, in his recent survey, reports that the equity at stake which is the change in CEO wealth from a 1% change in stock price for the median S&P 500 CEO was almost $600,000 in 2010 and has been at that level or higher in all but one year since 1998. So overall, the evidence is consistent with realized CEO pay and CEO wealth being strongly tied to firm performance. And in their surveys, Kevin Murphy, uh, as well as uh, Carola Friedman and Dirk Chenter reach similar conclusions. Now, the more difficult question, which I think is uh, not clear, is how much pay for performance is optimal and whether the current practices can become more efficient. Uh, some argue that pay for performance is too low and should be increased. Others argue that some pay for performance incentives, particularly in financial services, are too high and should be lower. Uh, pay for performance is also criticized because pay is based on absolute or actual performance rather than performance relative to a firm's industry. And in other words, CEOs and executives are paid to some extent for general economic conditions or luck. So while the lack of explicit relative performance evaluation is a puzzle, uh, it's worth noting that private equity investors, who we know are strongly motivated to make profits, uh, do not appear to use relative performance evaluation for CEOs of their companies. And if relative performance evaluation were meaningfully more efficient, you might expect to see private equity investors make more use of it. So now to the third perception. Uh, are boards doing their jobs? And critics contend that boards have become too friendly to management. And as I mentioned earlier, the turnover results suggest the opposite. CEO turnover levels appear to have increased since the late 1990s, meaning CEOs can expect to be CEOs for less time than in the past. And it's also the case that CEO turnover has become increasingly related to poor firm stock performance. So the CEO job is riskier and CEOs face significant performance pressure. So that's actually consistent with a corporate governance system uh, that has performed better since 1997. Now there's a recent paper by Genter and Llewellyn that presents additional evidence consistent with this. They look at CEO turnover in the execucomp data from 92 to 2004 and they find that boards aggressively fire CEOs for poor industry adjusted performance and that that turnover performance sensitivity increases substantially with higher quality boards. So what you see there is in the first five years of a CEO's tenure, CEOs who perform in the bottom quintile relative to their industry lose their jobs about 60% of the time and CEOs in the top quintile lose their jobs only 18% of the time. So there's a very big spread between companies that perform well and companies that perform poorly. When you focus on boards that are more independent uh, and have greater stock ownership, 
that spread increases to more than 70%. So as with pay for performance, the more difficult question is whether those differential departure rates are optimal and whether the current practices can become more efficient. So now it would be useful to know what shareholders think of all this. And fortunately, I'm not sure fortunately is the right word, but fortunately, uh, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform uh, and Consumer Protection Act of 2010 mandated that all firms with more than $75 million in publicly traded stock hold a non-binding shareholder vote on the compensation of the top five executives. And those votes are known as say on pay votes. The law went into effect in 2011. The supporters of the provision believed that by increasing shareholder power, the say on pay votes would reduce the CEO pay spiral and would increase pay for performance. This is more or less the view of those who take the managerial power position that CEOs have captured the pay process. Under the alternative view that pay levels and pay for performance are largely determined in a competitive market, the say on pay votes would be a non-event. So the pay on pay votes set up a useful test of the managerial power view versus the market for talent view. What happened? The votes in 2011 were overwhelmingly in favor of existing pay policies. Roughly 98% of companies uh, received majority support. More than 73% received a favorable vote above 90%. And fewer than 8% of the companies received a favorable vote of less than 70%. And to this point, the 2012 votes have followed a pretty similar pattern. So the few companies that didn't receive majority support, as well as some of the companies with a substantial minority of no votes, suggest that some CEOs undoubtedly exert managerial power and some boards uh, are perceived to have problems, but they appear to be the exceptions and the no votes from shareholders actually highlight those exceptions and put pressure on boards to fix them. At the same time, the positive shareholder votes for most companies seem inconsistent with the view that CEO and top executive pay are driven largely by managerial power. Rather, again, the votes are more consistent with a market-based view of top executive pay. So given the negative perceptions of CEO pay and corporate governance, you might also think that corporate performance has been poor. And let me conclude by taking a look at that. The US economy has gone through a financial crisis and recession, and the S&P 500 has declined uh, from its peak in 2007. And at the same time, we saw CEO pay has also declined. What's happened to the operating performance of the S&P 500? And when you look at that, uh, S&P 500 companies, and it's the green line on the top there, uh, have weathered the downturn surprisingly well. Median operating margins, uh, which is operating income to sales, increased from 93 to 2007. They dropped in the crisis, but then recovered to their highest levels uh, in the period. Net debt also declined uh, pretty substantially over this period. Uh, this includes some financials. The performance of non-financial companies has been even stronger. So on average, you know, particularly for non-financial companies, average operating performance has improved while average compensation has declined. So to summarize, I've considered the evidence for three common perceptions of US CEO pay and corporate governance. CEOs are overpaid and their pay keeps increasing. CEOs are not paid for performance and boards do not penalize CEOs for poor performance. And the evidence is somewhat different from those perceptions. While average CEO pay increased substantially through the 90s, it's declined since then and CEO pay levels relative to other highly paid groups today are comparable to their average levels in the early 1990s. In fact, the relative pay for large company CEOs is pretty similar to where it was in the 1930s. 
Furthermore, the ratio of large company CEO pay to firm market value has remained roughly constant since 1960. Uh, second, on average, CEOs are paid for performance and penalized for poor performance. And finally, boards do appear to monitor CEOs, and that monitoring appears to have increased over time. So Kevin Murphy concludes what is a very impressive and detailed survey of executive compensation with the conclusion that executive compensation is affected by an interaction of a competitive market for talent, managerial power, and political factors. And that conclusion is very hard to disagree with. There have been corporate governance failures for sure. They have been pay outliers where managerial power is surely exercised and the pay levels are very high. And those are sources of the common perceptions. That said, a meaningful part of CEO pay appears to have been driven by the market for talent. In recent decades, CEO pay is likely to have been affected by the same forces of technology and scale that have led to the general increase in incomes at the very top. Now for researchers, this still leaves a number of questions. In particular, it would be useful to quantify or nail down the relative contributions of the market for talent, managerial power, and other considerations. And there's certainly room for more work on understanding what incentives are appropriate under what circumstances. And for boards, the evidence explains why compensation and the role of boards are likely to remain challenging, if not controversial. The market for talent puts pressure on boards to reward their top people at competitive pay levels in order to both attract and retain them. And at the same time, boards are affected by the accurate perception that pay is high relative to the median household and by the negative publicity from pay and governance outliers. These perceptions and the current lackluster economy create political and popular pressure to reward top people less. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to any reactions you might have. Thank you. I think the, the forces which we, you and I talked about earlier, you know, technology uh, allows you know, a CEO to look over uh, a much larger corporation than he or she could have 10, 20, 30 years ago. It allows you know, a trader or you know, investor can manage billions of dollars where you, know, you couldn't have done that uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you see it in athletes. I didn't you know, point that out here. Athletes have gone up. Uh, actually a little bit more than the CEOs, and that's also technology and scale. So, you know, technology, scale, I guess, you know, globalization, which are all buzzwords, I can't nail that down other than to say the fact that, that these increases are across all these different groups suggests it's something, you know, that's uh, rather than being governance specific, it seems like it's a more general phenomenon, which, you know, obviously many people have, have written about. Uh, yes. So the question is, what's the proportion of, of stock-based versus uh, fixed? Very, you know, stock-based compensation has increased markedly over this period, really starting in the 80s. And that big you know, jump up in the mid-90s was a big increase in option pay. And since the 2000, the options have come down and they've been replaced by restricted stock. So it's still, I think the majority is restricted stock and options. So it's, it's very much uh, equity-based. 
um, and much more so today than it was uh, 30 years ago, where it was much more cash-based. So have you thought about the incentive to give in terms of how the distribution is paid and how it's going? Is that something that you For example, if the uh, is more and more by the variable stock-based compensation, would I, as the CEO, Yeah, I mean, that's a, so the question is, does this, you know, greater emphasis on shareholder value? Um, and again, it's not, you know, what's, what's interesting here is it's not unique to the public company CEOs. It seems to be true across these different groups. I suspect has had, you know, could very well have had something to do with uh, the, you know, what you've seen over time with the substitution of technology that's, that's uh, certainly consistent with, uh, with, with what we see. Right. The general theme of what you're saying is that it kind of makes sense to pay the top guys in these super valuable organizations a lot to get the right talent there. University presidents also run big, complicated organizations. They get paid one tenth as much. Do you, are, we, are we vastly underpaying President of Harvard University of Chicago and not getting good talent up there? President of NBR. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, the, the, pre the president of NBR was, was even manning the camera earlier. Um, so, um, the, uh, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, there's also these questions of, you know, you don't see the CEOs get paid as much in Germany or Japan as in the United States. And, and that's a much harder question, which I don't, you know, I can't answer with this. What I can tell you with this is that all the, these groups who are, for profits and motivated for profit, it's pretty, it's systemic. And uh, the university presidents, you know, which is, is a very hard job, are, you know, paid less, and that's uh, not part of this group. Although, their pay has increased quite a bit over the last 30 years, so on a relative basis, it's not clear uh, that you would see anything uh, different there. Yes, in the back. Your, your So the question is about severance payments. No, it didn't include severance payments. There's a nice paper, um, I think Goldman and Wong, that looks at uh, S&P 500 CEOs who lost their jobs. And the median severance for S&P 500 CEOs over I think, the last 20 years, the median is zero. So, and the average is, I think, four and a half million dollars, which is about half a year's pay, um, relative to there, you know, which if, if you take the six hundred thousand uh, dollar value at risk, it's about an eight percent stock movement. So severance would would affect this a little bit, but it would not, you know, the pay for performance would not be affected by very much by sticking that in. Uh, Chester. So I, I, I misspoke on that. What, what, I shouldn't say I misspoke. The, there are people in this room, I think, I think Lucian and, and Luigi would be two of them, uh, who would say that pay should be explicitly, or some portion of pay, pay should be explicitly tied to relative performance rather than the absolute stock performance. Most companies don't do that. And it turns out there's a lot of variation is cross-sectional. So when you look at industry-adjusted performance, which, which we did, you find a lot of um, pay, you know, pay is definitely related to industry-adjusted performance, but there is some sense in which pay is related to industry performance or the general performance of the market, which some people think, and, and rightfully so, it's a little bit of a puzzle because, you know, as CEO, you can't control what the overall stock market does. So that's, that's the sense in which it's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, it doesn't seem, again, private equity investors don't make that adjustment. Some public companies are pushing that way, but it's, you know, I'll leave it at that. So there's clearly,
compensation based on industry adjusted performance, but you also have the industry uh, and the market in there. Yes? Yes, I'm just curious in that first look you took at the S&P public companies, if you happen to just dice it up by financial versus non-financial, you mentioned the differential later on in performance, did you see whether there was a significant difference in, in pay for financial institutions versus non -financial? So the question is, were financial institutions different from the non-financials? And what you see, financials were in the S&P 500, or I think they're about you know, 15, 20 percent. Uh, it's less than 20, it's more like 15. And the pay for the financials went up by more, and now it's come down so by more. Yes, yes. So it very much, it sort of moved more with the, a um, little bit more with what was happening in finance, which is, again, would be consistent with this general market for, or not general, but with a market for, for talent. Antoinette. So the, the question is explaining the level differences across countries. I, 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 I agree with that completely, um, that uh, the U.S. is higher, although not so much higher as it used to be. The U.K. actually, uh, to some extent, caught up, and some of the other countries did as well. Um, but the, you know, some of those level differences are puzzles. We'll have, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just agree with you and say I don't have a, a good answer for that. Uh, Xavier? Yeah, I mean, I think Kevin, Kevin Murphy has a paper where he does, he, he has it with, with a couple of co-authors where they control for firm size and control for, for other things, and they still find a premium in the U.S. It's not as big as the uh, premium you just compare by means, but it's, it's still there. And I think if, if, if you adjust for, he adjusts for stock options and says they're riskier, and he actually gets it closer, but that argument is, is one that you may or may not uh, agree with. Are we, uh, it's 5.30, and I think uh, it's actually good. So thank you.